Africa has the youngest population of all the continents, uh, continents and is, is projected to have the largest working group of 1.2 billion people by 2035. Now, to profit from this demographic dividend, the continent is tapping into potential new technologies to accelerate growth and development, primarily shifting the focus on encouraging a sustainable tech ecosystem. Now, seven of ten of the world's fastest growing internet populations is in Africa also, which means innovation has the potential to connect the cities, countries, drive economic growth, and also leapfrog Africa into the fourth industrial revolution. But this can only happen if the private and public sector and academia come together in building a sustainable environment. My name is Maggie Motesi, and uh, this is CNBC uh, East Africa's uh, special debate as we explore the possibilities of a greater access to investments and the scalability of the startup ecosystem in the East African region. I am joined by a vast uh, group of uh, industry players. On my left, immediate left, is Honorable Jean Dedieu Rurangira, the Minister of ICT in Rwanda. Uh, next to the Minister is Sean Ndiho, the founder of Sobek Capital, and then the CEO of uh, BK Tech House, Regis Rugimashuro, and then Henry Nyakarundi, the founder of Arid. Thank you, gentlemen, for having time to come to the studios. I want to put some statistics down to just uh, lay down for us the conversation. We have over 300 hubs in the African tech startup ecosystem. Where 360 million smartphone owners are expected on the continent by 2025. We should also note that internet penetration is just at 29% throughout Africa and about 18% in Rwanda. I want to start up with the minister. Now, we know that Rwanda has been on top of technology. You've been in, in the industry for quite some long time. Uh, just give us an idea of what reforms the country has adopted in the past few years uh, to, to be able to brace this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rwanda uh, have taken a number of initiatives to, to foster the, the, the innovation. Uh, first, by creating an environment uh, made of uh, regulations, uh, strategies, policies that uh, promote the use of uh, ICT and uh, innovation in transforming uh, the, the, the socio-economic uh, situation of, of the country. Uh, yes, uh, we can see that uh, throughout uh, all uh, sectors of our economy now with uh, mobile penetration, with uh, uh, innovation in mobile services and mobile money. Uh, as of uh, last year, more than 46% of our population had access to mobile money and we could see a big increase in, in transaction now um, reaching around 600 billion. Of, of Rwandan francs, and uh, we could also see how government uh, services are being uh, online, uh, government to government, but also government services to, 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 to citizens. All those uh, have been uh, created by the environment created by government, but also um, private sectors and partners that are playing a major role in fostering the innovation ecosystem. I want, I want to bring in uh, Regis. You've had the minister. The government is, you know, trying to set the pace uh, for the sector in the country. I bring you in as the private sector. Uh, what, what are you doing on your end as BK Tech House? Uh, thank you, Maggie. Uh, as BK Tech House, what we are doing to foster innovation or actually build what we call digital ecosystems is just trying to implement what we call inclusive collaboration. Uh, many of our platforms that we've built uh, in education, agriculture, real estates, and in a few months in, in healthcare, which by the way now, uh, about two weeks ago, we just passed the one million milestones of registered digital users, um, is built in collaboration with many stakeholders, uh, especially uh, the government, uh, where we work with one agriculture board. Uh, what I mean is I say is, uh, is, is, is we're very right. Um, we wouldn't have that many users if there, was not, there were no regulations, incentives, uh, and a co conducive environment to facilitate uh, initiation and partnership between private sectors as well as, uh, as, um, uh, as government. But beyond that, what we're doing as a, as a group now, BK Group, uh, uh, through Rumori Initiatives, we are funding new innovators. Where we, every year we're going to be giving 60 uh, million Rwandan francs, uh, zero interest to young entrepreneurs, not necessarily in age, but new ideas, new projects that foster um, uh, digital 
uh, solutions. Yeah. Uh, but also, again, our, our end goal is to build 3 million digital consumers in the next uh, five years. We are over 1 million now in just in about less than two years, actually seven months from the launch of our first platform. Uh, so we're very confident that that's going to happen. And what we're going to do is open it up. Uh, we believe that uh, by if we manage to do it very well and have actually 2 million people, let's say, or 3 million if we get there, uh, and using our services through um, uh, mobile devices or tablets or, or laptops uh, with no requirements to have a bank account, um, getting services in agriculture, in education, or the real estate, or even in healthcare. We believe that by bringing new innovators, whoever can add value to the ecosystem, uh, we're, we're going to open it up more banks, more insurance companies, telcos, micro insurances, uh, micro uh, finances, uh, SACOs. We want everyone to, to really be able to tap into the ecosystem because once it's live, then the more players uh, providing value, the more choice people will have, and the more value will be created throughout the world. I want to bring you in, Henry. I don't know if I should still call you a startup. But no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been in this uh, you know, space for some time. You've heard from the minister, from the private sector person that we have on the panel at the moment. Uh, give me a sense of the policy arms from your side of things. Well, uh, our business, first of all, is uh, we, we, we build small distribution network across uh, Rwanda, and mostly in rural areas, semi-urban area, and refugee camps. But also we incorporated a very innovative business model. So we recruit, we train women and people with disability to operate our equipment, and we have a revenue sharing structure. The, the, the challenge is, uh, for, for, for us is how to improve uh, partnership between private sector and government, especially startups. It's very challenging uh, to do so. I can tell you from experience, uh, you know, we, we, we always look, work with local government that usually uh, select the different groups we can uh, pitch to about the, the recruitment process. And that process usually takes between eight months to a year. From the time we engage the conversation to the time we get an MOU, and by that time, there's a lot of things that happen. Sometimes uh, local government change, so you have to restart the, the process again. So, you know, that, those are the, 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 the things. But again, we, we, we have to work with uh, uh, government to really uh, scale up and, and, and uh, bring the solution that we can uh, in the area we're trying to tap into. Hello, Minister, want to throw in something? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, as I said, uh, what we are experiencing today, the progress we are seeing, is combined effort between uh, government but also the private sector. Uh, we have situations where uh, government came in and, 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 and did some huge investment actually to, to, to create such environment, but we know uh, government can also have some limitation in terms of building uh, the whole ecosystem. It does need uh, the private sector. Of course, uh, there are challenges, and uh, if we are committed, uh, which is the case, we have to keep engaging each other and uh, improve in those processes. Uh, I would take this opportunity to announce that uh, we are validating a new strategy, actually aiming at uh, uh, creating more value. Uh, the strategy is for IT enabled uh, services uh, for export, where we realize that uh, to get where we want, to create more value in, in, in IT industry, we need to, to create more opportunity for the local market. I, I think uh, some action points uh, will trigger some improvements in the way the, the, the opportunities are created for the, the local industry, the startups, and so on. And uh, what I would uh, say is, yes, we are here to create such environment, but also to, to, to sustain it, which means we are open to, to be engaged by the private sector for any challenge. But also, most importantly, by the startups. Yes, startups. Yeah, we have been yeah. actually working closely with... Henry seems to have something burning, but I'm so going to come back. Yes, yes. <laughs> very excited. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just... Let me just. Yes, okay. yes, yes. <laughs> well, I'll give you an example. Yes. You know, me, I like to be... Um, yeah. Yeah, so really when, when, you, when you want to work with uh, government, right, right. Um, whether it's local government and all, you have to bring a proposal, right? That's true. That proposal is a written paper, right? right. You have to drop at the 
secretary office, yes. right? I can't tell you how many times they lost a proposal. So a lot of times, for example, you have to come back and bring it again. All I'm saying is now with technology, um, you can digitize, for example, that process. Another problem is we, every district we try to go in, we have to go to that district level. There is no entity where we can go to one entity trying to reach the whole district, at least for, for me, I haven't seen. We try local government, uh, ministry, and they tell you, uh, you have to, to go to those districts and engage them. All I'm saying is uh, for, for innovation uh, to really spread out much quicker for the startup level, there has to be, you know, we have a one-stop shop. We have RDB. It's a one-stop shop. It's a great, man, it's a perfect place. There should be a one-stop shop for partnering with government, for example. That, that would change the game. Uh, Personally, that's uh, 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 Before I bring in the Honorable Minister, because I'm sure I would love to chip in something, I'm going <laughs> to give uh, Sean a chance to yeah, throw yeah, in yeah. something. <laughs> sure. You are um, uh, um, into venture capital. You, you, you look for funding for startups across Africa. You've done this in London. Um, what, what do you guys always look out for in these startups? And what, in your own idea, should be the starting point, you know, looking at all the challenges that we still have in the, in the region? Well, once again, thanks for giving me time to be here. Um, I think we look for great, great founders like, um, like Eric Henry. But to kind of be elaborate, we also tend to look for traction. So the problem with that particular point is the fact that for companies to actually to get traction, they have to have some sort of structural support. And I've been here for the last four months now, and I can definitely see there's a big gap in terms of the structural support available to startups. And that's one of the things actually we're going to be able to um, contribute to. And perhaps also take this opportunity to also announce that we've already made a couple of investments here. So hopefully we can be able to show um, what that looks like in terms of the impact we have on those companies. Honor Minister, are you really doing enough to engage with the startups uh, like Henry's, especially to build something sustainable? Yes, uh, on two fronts. Uh, one, uh, I know with innovation, uh, there is always uh, uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, government uh, as uh, in the, the structure of government or, or any organization, I think there is uh, an accountability mechanism that is actually a set of rules and regulations that people have to comply with. Then, then when you talk about innovation, uh, sometimes you find that, yes, with innovation, there are steps you go through or coming up with an idea, uh, creating a prototype, doing a proof of concept, then uh, the rollout of the product, uh, then the scaling up the, the product on the market, which is slightly different from actually the way government operate. Uh, but uh, I also recognize that uh, there should be a way of uh, creating an, an environment where actually those new innovative way of coming up with products of actually uh, fostering innovation uh, accommodated in government processes. Uh, I could say uh, we are discussing with Rura a way of coming up with uh, a sandbox uh, package for innovation, which actually would create an environment where new idea and new way of accessing the market can be uh, availed to, to startups. Yeah. Talking about uh, uh, engaging startups, uh, you all are aware about the, the, the innovation fund now that is uh, being operationalized. Uh, $100 million available to innovator in various domains. I think that's the way also government is, is using to create such environment, but also uh, remove some of the barriers that were actually uh, affecting innovators. I want to bring you in. Um, you seem to have something yes, you want to put across. Uh, yeah. This is a what Henry is, is uh, mm. saying is actually, I've heard that many times, it's actually one of the guiding principles that, get, that put us in a position to say, we have platforms, say especially in agriculture, where now we have 942,000 and over 150,000 in education. You say, we can do it all, right? We're a technology company, we're in it for business. We also acknowledge the fact that we can do it all. So that's why we decided we're gonna open up the ecosystem. It's growing, and that's why we were actually talking earlier before we kick off, because we're saying, once we go now, we've passed a million. Uh, so very soon we're gonna get to two million, right? And we're thinking, uh, if you have your, we have farmers, right? These are farmers, we know over, many of them don't have a bank account, for instance, to say. And many of them, some of them don't even have electricity, right? So we're thinking of ways, 
uh, one of the issues we're going to solve, besides just our business, like what make, give, makes us money, is also allowing new startups who now, very, one of the challenges they have is to reach the market, not only from uh, financially, because you know, reaching one million, and it, it requires some, some, some logistics, but now you actually have an ecosystem of 1.5 million people available to you, provided your service adds value. You have 10, 15 of you guys doing probably the same thing. Whoever wins, now you have access to all this market. So I think uh, it's one of the things that we see starting next year, once actually we, when we start providing APIs to tap into the ecosystem, we're gonna see more new startups now having access to, and hopefully we'll see, that's what we expect to have. And so hopefully we, that's something you can leverage. Now I understand, Regis, you've been working closely with uh, universities and uh, secondary school, you know, uh, secondary schools here in Rwanda, building some of your products. Uh, one of the things that has been mentioned out, especially has been with skills and education, especially in this uh, ecosystem. Uh, how has been your experience, especially working with the academia? That's, that's, very, that's very true. Though you can come up with the most brilliant solution if the end users can actually consume it. Yep. It's, it's, a, it's a waste. So what we have done, we spend a lot of time I mean, with farmers uh, to build softwares as well as teachers and students, actually administrative of, of the schools. Because uh, as always we call uh, user experience. Actually we let them design how the system will look like for them to use it. Um, but throughout of it, it's a, it's a, it's a very, tedious process, but that is mandatory, necessary. If you really want the system to be used efficiently, you have to spend time to train them. In fact, actually, we had been thinking about tapping into the universal fund because we have found ourselves teaching people how to use the laptops, right? <laughs> how you actually open a browser and do. Mm -hmm. So, but those are, that is needed, but it's also something you have to plan for as a tech company. If, if you build a solution, as much value as you can provide, you also have to have funding or means or partnerships. That's why we were discussing with the minister earlier how we can tap into this uh, ICT uh, ambassadors because we have a pl platform, we spend most of the time making as good as it can be and, and scaling it. But now when you have to spend extra time actually thinking someone, this is how you open a browser, this is how you, you know, make sure your password should be, different characters. That are, so those are skills that you have to, unfortunately, you have to spend time and invest in teaching those people. Once you've done it once though, the better thing is once you've done it once, you can have actually, they can use many, many more products to come. And we all win. He wins, everyone wins, I win, because now I've laid the foundation. And at some, some area, we benefit from what Irembo has done, because uh, and someone who's already used to get Irembo's uh, services, use, ping, ordering their fertilizers on, on our application through USSD was quite easy. So there's some synergy that can be done. And, but back to your questions, we do have to think about training and getting people that basic level of ICT literacy, you know. Now, we know, Honorable Minister, that the government in the past has especially uh, created a lot of in, uh, initiatives with uh, school children from the one laptop per child to other, you know, innovative ways. Um, but how more do we engage, especially in terms of research? Because a lot of universities, when students leave schools, you know, they have a lot of research, you know, they have come up with. How do we leverage on this to be able to provide solutions to our people? Yeah, thank you. Uh Yes, we're discussing uh, about uh, today's event we had this morning. Uh, we're having a Digital Talent Day, uh, which actually uh, is a platform where we bring together all stakeholders that are involved in digital literacy uh, as per our digital talent policy. We have realized that we really need to, to tackle the issue of literacy or, or knowledge. Uh, at various uh, levels or where we are considering the, the experts, which are actually the one from university, uh, graduating from tech schools. Uh, yeah, from them we expect solutions to, 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 to improvement in our processes, but also uh, we expect creating new products that can create value. Then we have uh, a level of uh, workforce where we need again uh, the, the technology to improve the way uh, the work is being done uh, with various programs to increase their digital literacy. Then we consider now the, 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 the lower of the pyramid where we have now the citizens. We are creating a lot of services to, to the citizen through eRembo, through BK Tech, Tech House and so on. So those people actually need to have capacity to consume and to use those services. That's where we have the Digital Ambassadors Program. Now we are com com completing the, the, the proof of 
concepts first. Where about 50 ambassadors have been trained, and I've trained about 12,000 uh, citizens on use of various services using their mobile and, and so on. And actually, what you need to, 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 to roll out your systems. I think as a new partner in the ecosystem, I think we'll engage you and see how the package we are offering to the citizen actually match the services that are being rolled out. Uh, Sean, I want to hear your thoughts on yes. skills and education. Um, so there's, there's a couple of points. So one of, some of the companies we backed are actually um, are involved in this particular space because mm -hmm. we noticed that there's, there's two angles here. The first one is most people that are here, I mean, when technology companies, you tend to build, uh, you tend to build trying to solve solutions, they actually, uh, trying to provide solutions to the problems that you see, but it's also informed by the exposure you've, you've had. So, for example, if I'm, I've met a few companies here that are building stuff that are also similar to other people are building, but they have no idea what's actually happening outside. So I think it's important if you actually get our people to be exposed to other things so they have a global awareness, because I tend to find that they tend to have a local perspective, and that local perspective doesn't help them to build global, scalable companies. So that's one, uh, one issue. The second issue is we also need to really have deep understanding of the depth of technology actually exposing to people. So some of the kind of companies that I've seen, especially here, we are still at the low level of sophistication in terms of the companies you're building, but the capacity is there. So which goes basically, we're all solving problems. You're trying to me they build the wrong solutions for the, for the population. No, basically. You want to say something, uh, Henry, on this? I want to be as one of the innovators, yes. Yes, so I think we need to have basically people that are brave enough, but that bravery is always informed by the exposure they've had. So we need to expose our people to basically more conferences, more, um, more tours. I mean, Henry has been to Germany and a few other places, and he's able to see what's going on there, get them to meet with their peers across Africa so they can actually have an informed opinion of what they're building. I want to pose one question to all of you before we get into the very short break. Um, are we really building the right solutions for the people? Well, I can, for us, we have a, a bottom-up approach. So our, our, our technology went to five different generation uh, to what it is today because of feedback we've got from the ground. Um, I, I truly believe, so I like to talk about innovation in, in, in two, two ways. There is traditional innovation and there is uh, innovation for social good. I like to separate them because it's, it's a different business model. But we are in innovation for social good. And for you, for, for any innovator that want to solve uh, or have a social impact on the ground. They have to have a bottom-up approach. Um, and I was wrong for a long time before we, I had the right model because of the feedback I got. Because when I started this innovation, it was based on what I thought people needed. And it was wrong. Uh, but I was able to find out. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there is, uh, as long as you have a, a, the right strategy and the right way to approach things, as far as I'm concerned, then yes. Uh, right. But you had to go through a certain phase to get to the uh, register you're building robots. You want to throw in something on this? Well, <laughs> the robotics camp was, uh, <laughs> the robotics camp came from uh, a duty we feel we have as a, so our, our, our slogan as BK Tech House is called powering innovation. Right, so when you power innovation, so there's just solving the problem, but also preparing the future. The theme I remember when we did it was uh, shaping the workforce of the future to strive in a digital world. Yeah. Right? So, and the kids we selected were from 14 to 17 years old. Because we know we're doing it now, right? But you know, it's like uh, we're doing it now because you're right, we're in a position, but we also have to be very strategic on how we prepare who's gonna do the future. We know artificial intelligence is, is, is one of the key, key technologies that's gonna change the world as we know it uh, with blockchain. So as a, as a leading innovative technology company, we have a duty to train young minds to actually get them to play with these robots. I mean. Anyone who was attended was, was, was just amazed about what they, these kids could do. None of them could code, other than maybe like three kids. But we just, it just proved the concept of if you expose the uh, uh, students to innovative technology and give them time, we brought in MIT students to train them. It's like the best of the best specializing in robotics with kids from Kirehe, Nyaruguru, and some from Kigali. And you see what in three weeks all of them can do 
equally without saying it's amazing. And it, for us, it gave us a confidence that hopefully, and I say this and I really meant it, we would love to hire, inspire them to, f to pursue this, the field. And who knows in the next 5, 10, 15 years, we hire them back to come and run things now with, you know, run, made in Rwanda robots. That's yeah, the dream. Literally yeah. testing. Yeah, exactly. So we're just going to take a very short break. We'll be back to touch into the private uh, uh, public partnerships and funding, the funding landscape, especially uh, um, in the East African region. We'll now take a very short break. You're still watching CNBC Africa. Welcome back from that very short break. You're still watching CNBC Africa and with me in studio to help us understand East Africa's, you know, tech ecosystem. Uh, we have the Minister of ICT in Rwanda, Honorable Jean de Dieu. We have um, Sean Indiho, uh, Regis Ugemanshuro, and um, Henry Nyakarundi. So um, I want us to start off this from uh, the public-private partnerships, Honorable Minister. Now, you know, this creating an environment uh, 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 that is conducive for the startups also requires a lot of investments in infrastructure, you know, from roads, railways, you know, telecommunications. What are some of the low hanging fruits, especially working with the private sector in Rwanda? Yes, creating a public private partnership, uh, yes, uh, it's uh, very important for, for, for the innovation ecosystem. As uh, from the, the discussion we're having, we have one stop center, uh, RDB, where everyone who wants to invest or having a transaction with government, being investment or implementation of, of big projects, there is a team to analyze and, and come up with, 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 with uh, uh, yes, I, I think, uh, agree on a proposal and, and way of financing and implementing. Uh, government project, infrastructure project, uh, as well as the investment. And the government uh, promote that by providing incentive depending on the, the, the investment, but also uh, specific uh, uh, area of investment uh, where government have really established as, as a priority. Uh, I want to bring you on, uh, um, Regis, especially now that BK Group is uh, cross-listing at, at the Nairobi Stock Exchange. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the group, you know, listing other arms of the business, like the tech house? Yes. Is fact, this something we should look out for? So we're listed as a group now, uh, let's, let's keep for now, and it, as technology-wise, it's easy to scale, actually much more easier than the yeah. bank is. And pretty much wherever we are, uh, we were having a very interesting conversation this morning at the African uh, Innovation Summit of some of the participants from other countries interested of, you know, we like what you're doing. How hard is it to, to bring it to, to Mozambique yeah. or Zimbabwe? I say, look, it's a platform. As long as you have a willing bank and insurance and a supporting government, because for, for this to work, especially what we're doing with the farmers, government play a key role in it. Right, providing access to the farmers, first of all. Um, providing, you know, they have their policies and how they run agriculture. That's very, very important. The platform in itself, there's no value without the people with the content, right? It's like Facebook with no, no content, right? So um, back to your question in terms of uh, cross-listing for our, our other subsidiaries. Uh, once the group is listed, uh, actually we'll be, we're probably going to be in many more countries before the bank. Uh, itself, uh, but wherever we are, actually, the bank will be there. Right? Is this something we're seeing soon, though? Uh, we're working on it. But in terms of the listing yeah. to Nairobi, yes, yes, very soon. For, for for the other arms of the group of BK Takeouts, yeah. I'd say, st looking at the proposals we have, uh, looking at early next year, we might be in a couple new new countries in the neighborhood. Okay, I want to touch on something. Uh, quite interesting, especially in the tech you know, sphere, which is funding, the funding landscape. Now, African tech startups raised funding in excess of um, 195 million US dollars in 2017. That was up from 51, up by 51% in 2016, with the number of startups securing funding also increasing to 159. While I was listening to one of your videos, Henry, the ones that you do on a daily basis, <laughs> giving advice to startups, you know, you mentioned something which is quite true, um, that 90% of the funders or the investors that also put money in these startups are foreign, foreign funders. But also according to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, 
uh, they have a report called Breaking the Pattern. Over 90% of funding for East African fintech startups typically goes to expatriate founders. Yeah. On this particular point, I want to bring you in, uh, sure. but also to, to, to have your thoughts on this. Uh, what has been your experience in this? Well, it, it, that's the reality. You know, we, uh, in our case, for example, 100% of our funding came from overseas, uh, Germany, the States. We have zero funding from Africa. So, um, but, uh, but, th but that, that's the problem. And, and we're in a space of, of a hard tech, which is a hardware and software component, which is even harder to yeah. raise capital uh, compared to just a software and an application. But that's just the, the reality where uh, funders, and I'm, I'm being totally honest here, foreign funders feel more comfortable funding uh, uh, companies or operation that have foreign entity I into their board or, and it's their money. They have the right to, to, to demand that stuff. Uh, but uh, some of the, the challenges we've had with funders was, for example, oh, you're in Rwanda. We don't know too well Rwanda. We don't know the policies in Rwanda. Uh, so now we are pushed to, to structure a group actually outside Rwanda to, to bring more capital uh, since we're planning to expand the, the, the company. Uh, so you hear all those little challenges, yeah. um, and sometimes is is challenges because they never been to the country or they never been to Africa. Uh, it's extremely challenging, and unfortunately, African startup uh, do not get the financial support for our own countries. And money is there. There is money. It's not like there's no money in Africa, but uh, and I'm talking about specifically in innovation. There, there is a lot of investment in different areas, but in innovation, because um, and I, there's many reasons, but the way I look at it um, is because that's not the focus. You know, most of the money is going to infrastructure and all those uh, things that are very important. But that, that's my take on it. I want to bring you on, in to throw in uh, your thoughts, especially the fact that you go around meeting different investors, raising you know funding for these startups in the region. So when I was um, when I did my first company, I've built and sold two companies. The first company that I built was a healthcare company, health uh, health products. We basically created the first skin toned band aids, uh, which are now available across twenty thousand target stores across the U.S. And um, That's a one of the things that. Huh? Sorry. Just One of the things that we, you know, we've kind of noticed al along the way was the fact that 90% of our funders were not Africans, even mm -hmm. though we're selling African-related products. So that's one thing. We still have a gap of understanding in terms of what angel investing is amongst our people. We're happy to buy a Range Rover, but we can invest $3,000 in someone's business. So those are the things we need to really address. And one of the things that we, I, I can definitely say on that point is the fact that there is a lack of education on what it is to be an angel investor. So one of the uh, initiatives that we kind of helped to start uh, is something called ABAN, which is Africa Business Angel Network, which pretty much is a network of networks. So the whole point is to connect local investors with international investors. Uh, but also here as well in Rwanda, I've been working closely with Minister, uh, sorry, the uh, Rwanda ICT Chamber to also create a Rwandan um, angel network, which perhaps you'll see very, very soon is what will be called RAIN. So Rwanda Angel Investors Network. And perhaps with that, we can catalyze some of the um, some of the uh, local. local funds, but yeah. also really teach people what it is to be an angel investor. Regis, you wanted to say something? We don't see much local uh, investments yeah. to the startups and seeing maybe those from abroad investing more. First, we have to admit the fact that the majority, I think, what's the ratio now? About 90% of the startups fail. Yes. Right? So, yes, that's, I mean, that's a fact. Now, that's why you have, so for the average person, even if we have with your money, it's, it's a risky investment. That's why when you have uh, financial institutions, let's say, I can speak on our behalf as BK Group, even when we do invest in you, you have to go through programs like Rumori Initiatives, which we don't give you money from straight from the get-go. You have to go through a seven-month incubation period where they teach you how to actually, you have a great idea. Everybody agrees. That's why you get selected. But you get trained on how to build a business plan, a marketing plan, how to speak in public, how to sell your product. By the end of those seven months, then actually you, I mean, from the last year was only eight from over 150 selected. But you understand you go through a rigorous process from which actually the investors feel comfortable. You know what? We give you this money free of interest. Yeah. And we feel confident even if it fails, you've tried and it's okay to fail, right? But we don't just give you money and if you fail, lose my money. So, and I'm sure even those foreign investors who don't invest is because they believe the person they're investing in 
it's not it's never easy i'm sure they they believe in you as a person they know your, your integrity your training your ability to run a business so i think maybe what we also need to think about is instead of you know innovators and entrepreneurs saying there's no money to fund our ideas are you actually willing because we have to be honest as well are they willing to go through a seven month process it's an 8 to 5 p.m. program you don't cut short and say or oh, are they you know I have a great idea if you give me a million dollars I'll build it so there's also that willingness to go through understand that you don't know it all you have a brilliant idea perfect but go through the shaping process of making you actually able to run a business or be able to get yeah or be able to actually be partners you be yeah. you'd be surprised how many people have you know you get a lot of people approach you say we have this many ideas oh you know someone else who's trying to do the same you tell them to partner they say no this is my my idea i'm not willing to partner so i think there's also though there's we have to grow some faith as maybe financial institutions but also the innovators need to believe that partnership partnership wins and also you have to you know, you have to earn your stripes. You but have to learn and learn to be better. There's such a huge challenge of better. moving companies from just, you know, uh, getting grants to building actually sustainable companies. You wanted to say something? No, I wanted to add uh, something uh, uh, and go a little bit further of, yeah. of the topic because what's happening now um, is that the few African companies that do get investment, uh, and I don't know all of them, but I know some that do get foreign investment, they require to sometimes structure the company outside the continent. So there's also a technology drain that goes because wherever the structure is, that's where the IP sit. Yeah. And if you look yeah. carefully uh, in, in Africa, you know, we have so much talent, obviously, we all know that. But if you look on paper, how much technology do we develop? On te there's, there's countries in Europe that develop more technology than the whole continent of Africa. And that's what I'm saying. We need to, to, to realize that if we don't build this ecosystem, we'll still be consuming foreign technology, even if it's technology developed in Africa. You know? uh, uh, and I'm to sorry to add Go ahead, Shirley. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the best products that has come out of East Africa is M-Pesa. Yeah. Right? But M-Pesa is actually owned by Vodafone in the UK. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, yes. Allow me to bring in the yeah. minister with this particular <laughs> point because, you know, how do we get local <laughs> investors, you know, yeah. act as a catalyst to building this uh, sector in the region? How closely are you working with the private sector, with yes. the local investors? Uh, currently, we are working with the private sector through the, the, the ICT chamber. We are engaging them on, on, on various aspects. Uh, while discussing, I think we've talked about the issue of education. I think education is key. Again, any investor will look at uh, looking for investing in any startup. I think it will have some analysis to, to conduct. It will actually analyze whether the, the, the startup is, is investable. And it's not just enough to have an idea, but also you should have actually a complete system around that idea and how you will scale it, how you will grow it, and, and, and so on. And I really appreciate what BK Tech House is doing, taking people through a process of incubation to make sure that actually that capability is built and, and the, the, the understanding of what it is required actually to, to create a company or, or, or a startup that can attract investors. I, I think we are engaging with, with uh, uh, private sector, uh, we are discussing and uh, while actually we are setting up the, the innovation fund, we are also considering that, that part, actually uh, how do we handhold those innovators with idea to the point where they can now have a product and the system around that, the uh, governance of the, the, their company and uh, that can really attract investment that can also be ready to, to scale as, as that, that is the, the target. Mm. Yes, no problem. You can chip in. No, sorry. You're okay. Uh, but I don't want to put all the, 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 the issues on government. I mean, uh, I think also uh, the problem is large corporation. If you look in the States, for example, you have the Google, the Facebook buying or acquiring uh, startups. You don't see that in Africa. The only company, the only telecom company that I know of that have an innovation funds, for example, is Safaricom. 
What are the MTN the Airtel are doing? You know, and this is what I'm talking about, huh? I want to chip in with something, you know, um, now that we actually, from the conversation, from the discussion, we should agree that funding is very fundamental, especially in uh, creating a sustainable ecosystem. But I want to touch on uh, regional integration. We have the AFCFTA that was signed recently. When markets are open, it means, you know, uh, capital flow in, investors are more confident because the money can come in, get out, you know, it's, they have a bigger markets. What are the opportunities of um, integrating regionally to develop technology? Yeah, uh, I think uh, when you talk about technology, you also, uh, any innovation is really not meant to, to solve just a local uh, yeah. problem. It's not a solution to a local problem. I think it it's a, it's a, it's a, should be a solution to a global uh, problem. When you analyze the big companies, they, they, the way they are scaling and, and actually spreading the, to the whole world, I think it's, it's tremendous. And when you consider the power of technology today, I think it's, it's, it's possible that you shouldn't be thinking uh, about just your local environment. And that's what is being now created with uh, CFTA, but also with Smart Africa. Uh, recently, uh, you were, were around in, in, in Transform Africa 2018. You would see how many companies, how many investors, or various people in industry that were gathering here in Kigali discussing various uh, opportunities and, and so on. In platform like that, I think that's where actually the whole market is, 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 uh, is being opened. It's now the whole African market with 24 countries involved with more than 500 million uh, people. Uh, I think in discussions that are being actually discussed, it's, it's how can we eliminate uh, non-tariff barriers that are actually hindering the, the technology penetration? I, I think we are now on the right uh, uh, path. We, we just have a few minutes uh, left, but uh, it, it's important to touch on uh, more innovative ways, especially to you know raise funding for startups in the region. How do you harness, uh, harness the diaspora communities, especially in terms of creating you know, this ecosystem? I just want to hear your thoughts. The fact that you've lived in Silicon Valley. Um, as far as diaspora is concerned, there needs to be clear ways to invest in African companies. I mean, let's say East African companies or Rwandan companies. So if you can create a fund where the diaspora can either invest in that directly, that's definitely have, you know, that's doable. Um, that has been done in other countries. I'm sure it can be done here. Uh, and also in terms of really creative, creative ways of raising more money for startups, I think we need to have um, once again, some tax breaks for um, for for angel investors would be wonderful. That sounds very exciting for you. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. It's because for me, I've seen it work. I've seen it work in the UK and it increased the participation of private investors by ninety five percent. So I can see that work here as well. Um, and and. In a similar way, the government has partnered on the innovation fund by providing 30% of the fund. They can, some of that can come out of that fund. So it's not as if we can't literally do it. Technically, it's possible. Um, so yeah, well, I'll let other guys also chip in. What I think maybe also should be should help or could help is uh, awareness of the diaspora of the kind of work being done in Rwanda. Here, I'm just thinking out loud and thinking of um, uh, Rwanda Day, I mean, a big event. I always attending the Rwanda Days, whatever they were, and it would be nice to have these selected uh, group of uh, innovators, uh, maybe who has a, a subsidy from the Innovation Fund, and given an opportunity to participate in a Rwanda Day abroad and actually present and pitch their ideas to a group of, uh, of a diaspora. I'm sure, I think, if I was still in the shoes well, living abroad, in right? Yeah. Yeah. Thinking of a diaspora fund for, for innovation, yes. right? And you know, the more you invest, the less the risk you have, and actually you get to do something for your country, as I know many diaspora people feel. Any time you feel like yeah. you can contribute without having to, without being, being here, but being part of supporting local talent, yeah. uh, I think that would be one thing that can contribute to it. We, we have limited time, if you can just throw in something. That 160 million dollars came into Rwanda in 2016 from the diaspora. So if you can leverage 10% of that, that's 16 million dollars you can invest in companies straight away. As we wind up, you want to throw in something, Henry? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I will tell the entrepreneurs uh, to also do competition. If you have a very innovative products, I mean, I, I funded 30% uh, uh, 
uh, of our technology through competition across the world. There's a lot of money out there for, for new ideas. And, and I don't see a lot of Africans, uh, entrepreneurs, <coughs> participating in those competitions. A lot of time I'm the only African uh, in those uh, spectrums. So I think there sh should be a push uh, educating and, and sharing that information. You know, funding is about access to information also. Hannah Burns, is this something uh, the government is looking at uh, in Rwanda? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think from the discussion, uh, education is key. Uh, creating more platform for, for people to access information, to connect, to know what is happening. But also creating such opportunity where investors can actually play their role and make sure that the regulation and policies are protecting their investment. I think that's also very important. Again, I refer to incentive. We have uh, an investment policy that is also applicable to, to investors in venture capitalists. I think we have to actually meet the requirement in the policy to, to, to gain those, those benefits. Uh, as government, we already started the, the innovation fund, which actually is a way also to, to attract more opportunity in that domain. I would be so mean if I don't ask this. Where do we see uh, this sector in the next five years? I will just give you just a few seconds to each. Yes, uh, yes. With the speed actually uh, on which the, the technology innovation is, is moving, uh, we are seeing a lot happening now. Uh, from the government perspective, uh, in the next five years, uh, we are talking about 2023-24. We have the objective to have all government services online. We have uh, the objective of creating a lot of startups now with uh, high value uh, on, on our market. I think we are very, very few, uh, around $50 million. So those are, those are plans. And what we are doing is actually to, 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 to create that environment that can allow those startups to grow. But uh, it's not only the role of government, it's also the role of investors, uh, innovators, and the private sector to play their role. You know, actually, the market is more for them to, 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 to grow, and the government is willing now to, to facilitate. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Honorable Jean de Dieu Lurangra, ICT Minister, Ashon Ndiho, founder of Subek Capital, Regis Rigmashur, CEO of Biketa Tech House, and um, Henry Nyakarundi, the founder of Eret. Now, as we move forward, a couple of things have been, of course, discussed and raised, but it's very key uh, and fundamental to find innovative ways of uh, involving the local uh, private sector to be able to uh, provide funding for startups in the East African region. You're still watching CNBC Africa. My name is Maggie Mortesi.